actually, Brent, I'm going to actually just start with one that uh, I have for you. If you, if the, please do. If you have, uh, if we know that biologic mesh has no long-term impact on recurrence of pietal hernias, number one, why use it at all? Or B, uh, if you wanted to fix a defect after a relaxing incision, why not take a piece of inexpensive proline mesh and just suture that over the hole in the right cruise? Well, um, the, uh, why not use the synthetic? I, no matter, even though you have a relaxing incision, I've not seen anybody's video or, or experienced that myself where the, where the mesh isn't going to be fairly close to the esophagus. So I just worry about it being there and, and rubbing and still eroding, even though it's off, off the midline. Um, and why use the biologic at all? Well, I think that in the difficult, uh, I only use it, I'd say, in, on the, in the complicated regions of parasophageal hernias, I'd say I use it maybe 20% of the time when, when, the, when the defect is really uh, difficult to close. And I don't, have a good ex I don't have a good answer for you other than I'm worried in those situations. And, and I think that um, the, the, the evidence that we have does suggest it prevents er may prevent some early recurrences, and those are more difficult to manage often. And finally, uh, after using it many, uh, hundreds of times, I haven't seen a downside. And we've compared, and in that trial, we compared people who, you know, the other potential downside complications, dysphagia uh, and other things, and didn't see any downside to it. So other than a little bit of expense, which if you use some of the biologics, they're quite expensive. So I use a something on the relative cheap side. Uh, I put it in, but that's the best explanation I can give you. I'm just curious of the other panelists, how many people would be willing to put permanent piece of mesh in, say a coated piece of permanent mesh to fix a difficult hiatus? Anybody here willing to do it? Well, I, I use um, a, a permanent synthetic mesh for a relaxing incision, but, okay. but only that, making sure that it never touches the esophagus or viscera. So, so David, I you know, struggled with this after where, you know, the trial follow-up data was published on our trial with, with uh, Brandt, and um, I actually went back to the data from, from Austria, um, Frank Randeras and, and uh, Rudy Pointner's data, which, in which they used a small, um, it's about one and a half by five uh, centimeter piece of uh, permanent mesh, and they put it at the top stitch to, to uh, further buttress the repair. Um, and so we've been using the Prytex coated uh, for about four years or five years now, and, and Jim Dolan and uh, myself. Um, and, and so, yeah, we, we do put a piece of permanent mesh there. It's not a big piece. We haven't had any erosions, and I believe it has reduced our, our parasophageal recurrence rate, although we, I don't think we have the data yet to prove that. It just seems to me it's a study that's crying out to be done because uh, certainly as I said in my talk yesterday, I've had transfers where there's been mesh erosion and creates a difficult problem, but I don't know what the actual frequency of it is. Any questions from the audience? Uh, Peter Gorecki from New York. I have a question to all panelists. You know, traditionally we pay a lot of attention uh, to identify and preserve uh, uh, vagi in original or initial uh, uh, anti-reflux surgery. You know, we kind of think less about it in revisional surgery because it's often difficult to identify, particularly anterior vagus. And we, as we know, overall results are not as good as uh, initial operation. To what degree in your practice you have these thoughts that uh, some nonspecific uh, symptoms perhaps can be attributed to a vagal injury or neuropraxia or vagal neuropraxia on your uh, revisional surgery outcomes? Why don't, John, why don't we just come from right to left on that and everyone can weigh in. Yeah, did, yes. I didn't really understand the question we asked. Repeat it, David, as you understand. What is the question? The, the question is, um, let me rephrase it a little bit and tell me if I get this right. How often do you think the anterior vagus is injured and what are the consequences and is it preventable? In, in the, general, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't know the frequency with which it's injured. I think it is preventable. Um, you just you know where it is and you don't cut it. But it is a, a, <laughs> occasionally sort of bound up in that scar right where the fundus uh, 
where the, where the uh, stomach is uh, sewn together. Um, and you know, it, there are probably about 20% of cases at the end of the dissection, we don't see the anterior vagus, so it probably did cut it. I don't think there are consequences of it. Yeah, I agree. You try to not injure it. You know where it is. You look hard for it, but it probably doesn't matter that much on the anterior vagus. Actually, Brant's got some data on this from the University of Washington. So. Yeah, it's one of those uh, papers that I, I wonder whether I should have <laughs> looked into and published way back long ago when I was young. Uh, we did do a, a study looking at um, the consequence of vagotomy in these situations, and really, for a unilateral vagotomy, especially the anterior one, uh, it didn't really see much consequence uh, between, you know, when that happened. Uh, and I think that the, the vagotomy is much maligned and, and is blamed for a lot of post implication problems, probably more so than it really is responsible for. I, that being said, I do my best to avoid injuring it uh, in the first or second or third time operation. Yeah, I, I don't have much else to say except remember back in the day of Dragstead, bilateral truncal vagotomy was only followed by gastric emptying problems about 20% of the time. So most of the time, you probably can damage them and it's not going to be a big deal. Having said that, obviously, we always search for and, and try and preserve them. The anterior one is the one at biggest risk because of the scar tissue, particularly with a Nissen as they come together. Trying to get through that, sometimes it can be very difficult to preserve the anterior vagus. Right, I want to uh, go back to John's comments about Grandorath technique. Their technique excluded the posterior vagus from the curl closure. And so there are still pockets around the country that are separating the vagus nerve, uh, or, uh, putting the Nissen, or the fundoplication wrap inside the posterior vagus. And so that can make a real challenge to preserve the posterior vagus. So that's, that's why I also like to look at the operative note to see if it was either excluded from curl closure or excluded from the wrap and try to make an extra effort to to save the posterior vagus, particularly because the anterior vagus is at risk. Right, I, and I would simply add that um, <clears throat> when you break into that uh, free plane, I mean, when you redo these, you always want to get to an undissected area, cephalad, and that's usually where I try to find it. It's usually on the left side. It usually is coming sort of somewhere between 1 and 2 o'clock. If you could imagine the hiatus is a clock face, and it's sort of strung out there, and then just try to follow it down. Why don't you go to this, this microphone over here? Uh, Garth Davis. Sorry, we have trouble seeing you, so it's... Uh, okay. <laughs> it's Garth Davis from Houston. I wanted to present a difficult case of mine and see what you would do with it. Um, this was a lady, BMI about 30, who came with a large parasophageal hernia type 3. Um, had to lengthen the esophagus, got a good closure, got a good Nissen, um, no mesh used, and um, she did well for two years. Then came back with recurrence, took her back to the operating room. I didn't do what Dr. Soper now said where I re took down the um, wrap because I had one of those type two uh, posterior fundus slipping in one spot, dissected it out nicely, had good tissue, though probably I was thinking scar was good tissue, but was able to close it easily. It lasted another year and a half or two, and she's now back with another recurrence. Now, do I go back, undo the wrap? She may just have too short an esophagus even to dissect out now for a second time. Is this a time where I would do a roux? Is it a time where I would change to a different kind of fund application? SP, why don't you start this? Let's start at this end here. Yeah, so um, yeah, we're just going to present our multi-fund application failure experience at, at DDW, and so we have about 100 of these, and about half of the, our third or later time we were able to do a fund application, but about, uh, about a quarter of the time we felt it was best to do a ruin why, either because the fundus wasn't amenable to doing another one because of contraction or because of uh, obesity. I and mean, if you think obesity is responsible for the fund application failure, clearly you should address that. Um, so. Now, just what I said, and that is don't keep doing the same thing and hope you're going to get different results. So, you know, if she's a little bit overweight and it's the third time, um, I would think the roux would probably, I would recommend the roux at this point, I think. Steve, one down line, Brent. Uh, I think the problem is, uh, is, uh, is you have too much posterior fundus. Yeah. Uh, and that's what's, what the problem. You didn't take it down the first time, so you might be, I think that increases your odds a little bit of getting away, getting, if you go in this next time and take it down and, and shore, shore up the funnel location. But I agree with everybody else that every single time you redo these, the chance of getting a good result goes down and you, it's going to be a judgment call on the third time 
whether the tissue at the hiatus and around your fundus is good enough to preserve it and get a durable result or, or go to a, a ruin Y? The other thing you might want to consider if you're going to redo the fundoplication, although bypass is definitely a good alternative, but if you're redo the fundoplication, consider that macro pledget of a you know, permanent mesh on the hiatus. Yeah, I, I would probably um, not really differ, except to say that I would uh, offer her a fundoplication if her esophageal motility were normal and her gastric motility were normal, gastric emptying. So I do study these patients on both the uh, stomach and esophagus because I want to preserve the best uh, of the two organs um, if you have to sacrifice one. Um, and uh, in, th in this case, I think the, the uh, esophageal uh, lengthening might be appropriate. You need to take down your fundoplication, and you may need to buttress the, uh, the height of repair a little better as well. So. Thank you. Stuff problems. Back mic on this side. Uh, Dr. Ali al from Basra, Iraq, GI surgeon. I want to ask about a failed redo procedure. Failed, I'm sorry, failed what procedure? Failed redo, nascent fundoplication. What are the options to me? Uh, re redo or resection? I, you know, I'll just start. I, I, I'm a little different than SP. I have a rule two laparoscopic operations, and then the third operation is usually the last operation I intend to do ever on that patient's foregut. And uh, either it'll be an open complex repair with mesh and lengthening or a esophagogastrectomy, to be honest with you. It's, I may be an outlier on the panel here since we have some great laparoscopic surgeons, but I, I believe in the, the rule of three operations. You only get three. Why don't we start at the other end? John? So I, uh, my, my story about this is, is when I had my first patient come in for their third redo and I called up Lee and I, I was in Atlanta at the time and said, Lee, I'm sending him out to Oregon for you to do this. And he goes, no, you can do the third time. Just go do it in Atlanta. <laughs> so, so we did and it, it actually worked pretty well. The guy didn't require anything after that. So I'm, I'm a sort of three strikes and you're out kind of guy. Um, but, um, you know, again, you, you got to really be careful that, you, that the uh, stomach and esophagus are working uh, well before you go into that third repair. Any other thoughts? You, you, yeah. SB, you seem to be much more enthusiastic about going back well, to third time laparoscopic well, I, I than I am. And if, I, I, mean, I would just emphasize what Nat said in his talk, and I think uh, I said yesterday, you can't do the same thing over and over again. You've got to find yeah. something, and usually in these situations, it's going to be esophageal lengthening or yeah. something that I you would can say, make. honestly, we're more likely to do a third time operation when the first two haven't been done by us. Right. I mean, if the first two have been done by us, we're going to change the plan. Okay, front microphone over here. Jose Julio from Rio de Janeiro. Uh, most of the recurrences occur anterior, and I have seen that uh, people usually put the mesh in the posterior aspect of, of the hiatus. And why don't put the mesh in the anterior aspect of the hiatus? Okay, so the question is, uh, just did everyone hear the question? The question is, that recurrences tend to be anterior. Why not put mesh anterior? Why are we bothering posterior? Grant, it seems like it's up to you, Alan. Well, I, I, when, when people ask, say that they see mostly anterior or posterior recurrences, I, I'm, I'm not sure I understand what that means because it's a hole and the, the recurrence is almost where the fund application sits and where it's going to go through. That being said, um, I, I do put, I do more frequently put the mesh anterior. If you look at, if I can bring my slides back up, but um, uh, what I showed in my video is creating more of a C so that the gap in the mesh is facing to the left so you have coverage anteriorly to the right and posterior um, because I do believe that that uh, is probably one of the weaker parts of the highest so if you can get some scarring uh, there you're better off uh, so I still have a tendency to agree with you but, but the other thing that's really important is not to do a keyhole yeah, right. Because yes, the mesh yes. will contract and virtually all of them will develop dysphagia. Yes, yes, thank you. Back microphone on the. Uh, on hello, the side. thanks. Uh, Chris Finnell, uh, Wichita Falls, Texas. Uh, thanks for an excellent session. Uh, this is kind of a carryover question from one of the sessions that were yesterday, the foregut sessions. I had a recent case of a redo, it was my own redo, and the patient had one of those big 
arteries running through like the pars flaccid that on the first one I had saved and preserved as I, the way I was trained is that if you see a big fat artery going through there you don't cut it and it just made it almost it was so so much harder trying to trying to preserve that artery in the panel one of the panels yesterday several of the people were just like oh you can just cut that with impunity and I just wanted to pull this panel to see what, what do you all think? Can you cut that artery if it looks big and it's going through there? Or so what? I'd actually like to comment on that because I used to clip it all the time. And then I was doing ICG, and I actually used that kind of imaging, found a big vessel, I clamped it just with my grasper, did the ICG, and the entire left side of the liver did not light up. Um, so I learned that you've got to be careful it's big. It actually might really perfuse something significant and could have an impact. So I'm lucky I was doing ICG. I preserved it. It was fine. Okay. But think about it. Yeah, so I, I think, uh, you know, that's a branch of the left gastric, and, it's, and it can be a replace. It can be, as it sounds like in Roy's case, a totally replaced left hepatic. You can mobilize it and move it caudally. It's some, sometimes a little bit tedious, but you have to take every branch that's cephalad to the big trunk and trace it back to its origin left gastric and then you can get it mobilized all the way caudal to the cur. So I don't, you know, I don't know how big is too big, but I worry. Yeah, and again, change your patient position, add another, you know, port if you need to to help retract and, and again, you know, do something to kind of make sure. It sounds like it's just visualization and, and manipulation and, uh, you know. You Y'all are, are saying you wouldn't cut it? No, let, let me let me jump jump in here a little bit because I would, um, and and the, ex, the ex, experience. So you try to save it if you can. I, I think we all agree with that. But in uh, these, this uh, anomaly is at least five percent of the time, and about 500 esophagectomies we've taken it probably 25 times at least a good sized vessel, and, and never had any significant, you know, liver problems as a result. There is one case that I remember very well in which we uh, took it, had to go back to do a redo fundo. This was a fundo case. And the left lobe was quite atrophic. But it was actually very uh, pleasant because there was no left lobe in the way. <laughs> so, so, so there are benefits to doing that, too. Yeah, and I've the, seen that several times, too. That's the hunter preconditioning uh, maneuver. <laughs> but re really, if it's a normal liver, um, Almost always you can take those with impunity, but I, I, I agree. I'd try to save it, but if it's in the way and you just can't do it, take it, and, and it'll almost always be fine. I think that the problem occurs when you divide it and then immediately compress with the retractor that left lateral segment. So if you're gonna if you're gonna divide a large one, then you just have to kind of give the liver some some breaths. You know, you take the retractor off after 10 minutes, and then maybe after another half hour, and just and see assess it. The, the one other caution I would say, say, and I'm sure you wouldn't make this mistake, but we have gotten patients sent to us where this is, they've been dealing with this problem, they've gotten into bleeding, and they end up stapling the left gastric to get control of everything. And, and then what happens is you've taken the short gastrics, and a lot of people start their mobilization a little bit farther down than just the short gastrics. You take the left gastric, you traumatize the fundus, maybe you mobilize the esophagus way up high, and I have had cases come to me with necrotic fundus that I'm, I know it's hard to devascularize the stomach, John, but it actually can occur in this setting. So it's one more reason to, to do as much as you can to save it. Over here. Yusuf Kutsi from Boston. Excellent session as always. Um, my question is about a previous uh, program session today, they mentioned about a habit approach, hell nesson. I'm curious to see from the panel over there if they have tried that kind of approach, the hell nesson, and if they did or did not, would they ever do that? Because I've never seen this before, the kind of hell slash Nissan hybrid, and I wasn't sure if I can put this in my practice. Yusuf, I'm not sure what you're, what the prefix you're using before hill. Nissan, what are you saying? The hill Nissan, hill. 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 Oh, hill Nissan, okay. So I have never done this in my practice, it was new to me, so I'm curious for this expert panel, have they ever done it? Would they ever consider that? Do we need to go to the Northwest for this answer? Well, it happens across the street for me every day, every week. Um, it's uh, Ralph A. Uh, at, in Seattle has been the, been the creator of that, that procedure. I talked to, to Ralph just a couple weeks ago, and he has, uh, his partners have been doing just a Nissan, and he's been doing a Hill, and 
he's having much better results. I told him that's just because he's a better surgeon than his partner. <laughs> But uh, he wants to do a trial to, to look at this, um, and so I think he's uh, looking to see how he's going to do that. So I don't think we know the answer other than that small small series. He's got good results. Yeah, they, they presented some data, although yeah. not prospective randomized, showing that maybe there are better results. And I must say that um, now if I have a huge hiatal hernia and kind of marginal length, I think it's just enough. I will often put in some gastropexy sutures, but not a formal hill, but right at that uh, upper proximal lesser curve back to the median arcuate ligament, and I think it potentially could help hold it in the abdomen. And I'll tell you one thing, you ever have to do a redo on those, good luck. That's, <laughs> That's what dicey. I thought. It's I mean, dicey. Yeah, you're getting the fascia, the, the aorta, so I mean. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's dicey. Thank you, Fahad Helgis Guzzi from Iraq, Basra. My question now, when we do a, a right relaxing incision, always almost we use a mesh, but there is a practice to use rotation diaphragmatic craft or left triangular ligament to close this or no? I have no idea. Could, 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 so you're could talking about taking the down the falciform and then using that to buttress the, the right relaxing incision. Yeah, I just don't know if that tissue is stout enough. Um, I actually, one of the dozen or so patients I've done that had a central failure of a lightweight mesh. So I think you do have, to, I mean, you'd think the caudate lobe would cover it in most cases, but I think you do need to use a, 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 some material that has some, some, some toughness to it because it is a bridge. And it, as a bridge anywhere in the abdomen, if, you do, if you're using lightweight material, it can fail. So you would never fix a ventral hernia with a, the falciform ligament. So I don't think you should do it for a bridge anywhere on the abdomen. Okay, last question over here. Hi, uh, Jeff Kraft, MIS fellow at Hackensack in New Jersey. Um, just a question about, um, this may sound like I'm passing the buck to anesthesia, but do you have any strategy for morbidly obese patients and uh, in the setting of a Nissen or a hiatal hernia repair, both primary or recurrent, uh, for a deep extubation or a no bucking type extubation? We've had a couple patients recur uh, shortly after surgery, and we kind of blamed it on that. <laughs> so I guess I'll start. You know, so we have a protocol of uh, um, some decadron, minimizing narcotics, you know, uh, toradol, IV Tylenol, to, just to try to get as much uh, scopolamine, try, try to get everything on board to try to minimize any nausea, and we try to wake them up pretty, pretty slowly. And we're communicating with them all along that they sh really shouldn't give any narcotic and really in the latter half of the operation, and that seems to help quite a bit. But you know, there are people who wake up, uh, wake up, uh, you know, dry heaving, and it's a real problem. I, I don't think anyone will ever eliminate that with any protocol. The, the other thing, there's a new medication that the anesthesia providers are using now where they can pretty much immediately reverse your muscle relaxation, and we found that that's super helpful so they can be deep throughout the case, and then when they're ready to extubate, they can pretty much reverse immediately. I'd like to thank all the panelists. The pre presentations were excellent, and thank you for great questions. Thank you. Good. Thanks, Gary.